podcast, I will explain nothing. And as such, uh, I cannot be held accountable for anything I say because I didn't mm-hmm. say anything. I don't give legal advice. I don't give financial advice. I don't give medical advice. Yes. Well, you might say things, but not about other things. Yeah, recommendations. But legal advice is a – the word advice – is a word that exists in the legal lexicon, and it means something. You're, it's kind of you're creating a contract with that word. It's like consultation. Yeah. So if you tell someone you're giving them advice, that puts you on the hook for that advice going wrong. So really, yeah, I don't give advice. But it's not your fault that you follow someone's bad advice. No, but you, if you if you tell them it's advice, you're putting you're putting yourself in a legal box. Wow. So well, I can I can make recommendations, but, but I'm not, not a professional. No. Yeah. In the same way, you know, like. Uh, Somebody's like, oh, I sell the highest quality coconut oil on the planet. And you're like, coconut oil makes your skin nicer. And mm-hmm. the FDA will drop on you because the FDA is like, we can't prove that because they've never tried, even though it's probably true because good oil is good for your skin. Mm-hmm. So um, today we're going to talk about glass. Ooh. Yeah, I just, um, I kind of running, this is number six. Mm-hmm. For, uh, I'm excited. We've gotten to a, a very sustainable situation with the podcast. I'm pretty stoked about yeah. the wearedenver.org yeah. podcast collective. Me too. Hashtag we are Denver. There you go. Yeah. That, that right there should tell everyone listening at home that I had a bit of a late night. My mouth might not work. So what were you doing today. last night? So I partied with uh, my amazing friends and we had a, um, Midsummer's Night Dream Party. Sounds and, magical. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a very magical place, and everyone goes really hard with the costumes. So it was fairies and mortals, and everybody goes all out. Amazing musicians. Did you go artists. all out? Did you make a costume? Yes. Yeah, so I, that's what I did all day yesterday. Nice. What was your... You were a mortal or a fairy? I was a fairy. I did uh, the little... Well, I, can't, I, I can't believe I keep forgetting the name of the... Um, you like the goat boy. What's that? Imp, right? Uh, like a... Uh, yeah. Mm. Like half... Like the goat legs? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to, there's a word for that. Um, um, kind of, there's the like a sat here, but anyway, yeah. I just, if I'd had more time, I was going to make like just fuzzy pants, mm-hmm. but I didn't have time. So I just made a fuzzy skirt. Okay. And then I found a sick vest, nice. um, for 15 bucks at Regal Vintage, big up Regal Vintage. Those guys are on point as okay. usual. Yeah. Have you ever been there? No. Oh man. You'd freak out. You, yeah. That place. It's like the, one of the highest rated curated vintage clothing shops I, I have ever been in. I have to get costumes life. and stuff all the time, so yeah, it's a good idea. I love costuming. Regal and then I also, vintage. I hit Joanne Fabrics. That's where I got my fuzzy pant fabrics. Okay. And I got a little like flowery wreathy thing and I tied it to a headband and stuffed some horns on it. Nice. I was going to do a little bit of makeup, but... Um, yeah, I was I'm pretty in... sure that technically makes you a satyr. I think there is a name for the the goat thing, but a satyr is, the, is the... like half man, half goat, and it's got the, the horns. The goat man. The goat man thing. Anyway, yeah, I was up all night with my most amazing friends, and it was an incredibly beautiful group of highly intellectual, highly talented people. It was one of those situations where I was just like, I can't believe this exists. Everyone here is amazing. Did you get some time to just bask in it? Oh, yeah, the whole, I mean, the whole night. Yeah. You know what's really funny? I've, um, I've, we, we haven't really talked about hallucinogens and altered states much, and we need to, we're going to do the official podcast. I've got, someone in mind i haven't reached out to them yet but uh dj consciousness i'm coming for you who yeah he's a really he's a magical dude he I can't should wait have been able to him. hear that if it's, <laughs> but anyway he should feel it reverberating yep um but it's interesting when people do drugs and they're kind of like dealing with their issues you know like there was a girl next to me who was like crying for you know it's hard to sell time on drugs but uh it was like two logs on the fire which is a good 45 minutes i think of just being like pouring stuff out and mm-hmm. people are like struggling with this and you can see people who've kind of forgotten how to talk and they're like wow. like they're kind of they're in their freaking out thing and I've just kind of like adjusted to the whole thing like the weirdness is just as normal for me and so I'm I'm just like hanging out at a party had a couple of beers kind of like sober mm-hmm. compared to most people for whatever mm-hmm. reason I just maintain control that's totally and, good I, and part of it is like an, I don't know, an unconscious ability to like kind of hang on to reality I guess but mm. Uh, anyway, it is kind of interesting to like see people like really in it and me be like, God, it's been a long time since I was just like, couldn't handle it. Yeah. You know, definitely. I haven't gotten hard in a forever, so that's part mm. of it too. But I mean, like a bunch of us were all at the exact same level last night, mm. all experiencing the same fun little, uh, caps and stems yeah. via chocolate. It's something that, uh, lots of humans have been doing for a very long time. There's a long Terrence McKenna thing about mushrooms and orgy being, uh. 
long-standing human tradition i don't really uh i can't i have never really connected on a uh sexual level like um with sensual mushrooms. with mushrooms because i get really in my head and i get really thinky i'm like mm-hmm. thinking about stuff you know mm-hmm. and maybe the, the you know the, the little man downstairs is like hey what's up i'm like i'm busy bro <laughs> hold on don't bug me but did you hear about this <laughs> So what are we talking about today? Glass? Yeah, let's talk about glass. We've talked about aliens. We were just talking about psychedelics. There's tons of crazy stuff we've talked about on the podcast. So I We assume, haven't even got crazy. I mentioned stuff yeah. like once in a while that hopefully people have picked up that like I'm prepping for that. And uh, there's there's a, the X is the only capital letter in Nothing Explained. And so that's kind of like, I want to lead back there as much as possible. But I also want to like, I don't know, like that's the whole thing is like the world is a big, big place and it's a yeah. hard to grasp a lot of stuff. And the real issues. You know, if 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 I was the Secretary of Education, you know, like what would I do? Well, first off, I would take away the Department of Labor's ability to handle curriculum and put it back in the Department of Education. But that's a whole other um, thing. Yeah. But there's a dramatic amount of lack of information in general, you know. And so, yeah. like, I really like the crazy information, true or not. Like, it's amazing. It's so much fun to like dig into and see what everyone's having to say. And there's some very interesting perspectives to be gained from it you know lots of common experiences that cannot be thrown out as pure coincidence and that's the secret of life really is it like there's this level of things that seem coincident which are not Mm -hmm. um but hey that's also my belief system and i'm willing to accept that that's maybe not reality but whatever i'm having fun it's let's call it information and entertainment but Mm -hmm. um that's fun for me that's my junk food but as far as what the people need uh, you, there's a baseline kind of missing in a general education, and uh, if nothing else, people need to understand that it's not that hard to like go out and find information and teach yourself something. We've mentioned the Devo, Denver Public Library on your podcast a couple of times, and yeah. like I love that thinking about the potential of like you can be a pretty down and out person, and there is like the world is still at your fingertips at that level. You just have to want it and go get it. But yeah. anyway, the kind of the point I'm focusing on the podcast is to like use really normal things to be like, this, this is a really deep world and you should be open to the idea that like there's a whole bunch going on and things you haven't thought about before. And most importantly, maybe I can clue you into a couple of keywords because let's say you're like, oh, I wonder how, I mean, we're talking about glass. I wonder how glass works. Mm-hmm. So they Google glass and maybe they just found the podcast and like, oh, this guy's just going to talk about glass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I really want to do is drop some keywords on you, which is going to save you all the time of Googling because if you knew what to call it, for example, like one of the things you'd never know that like blowing glass is also called lamp working, you know, and like mm. if you Googled lamp working, you'd be like 10 steps ahead of where like if you were just starting from scratch. So yeah. that's kind of where I want to go. But the reason that glass is awesome, um, I spent a lot, a year and a half in a glass shop and I've done a little bit of exploration, like business plans uh, revolving around the potential of glass and recycling glass. So I'm not an expert, but this is... I'm getting to the point now where I'm like, all right, I really have to put some serious time into creating this hour podcast. And this is one of the last subjects I feel comfortable just kind of like going off the top, you know? So, uh, but the reason that glass is really fun and cool is that, uh, glass is this very interesting kind of in between state of matter. And it is unexplained by science completely. They have no idea why it is the way it is. And essentially, uh, the word glass refers to any substance that doesn't really have a distinction between uh, liquid and solid and yet still behaves liquid and solid. And if, like, if you zoom in on glass, uh, if you like, good example. So water, when you cool it down and it freezes, what happens is you have these molecules that are moving around, yada, 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 bouncing around, and then yeah. you slow it down and they're having less chance of like just chaotic bouncing and they begin to form an order. And in mm. water's case... You know, you have these things that kind of fit, can fit tightly together that are bouncing around, but as it cools down, the, like attractions between the ends of the molecules take take precedent, mm-hmm. and the thing pops out into like kind of a hexagony thing, and kind of a little balloon blows up, and the yeah. whole amount of volume that that water takes up then expands, and that's why ice floats. Mm-hmm. So, and that's the normal process of from liquid to solid is like there's all these molecules bouncing around, and then they find an internal order, and then once they find that order, they become solid. Yeah. Because they're not bouncing around the way they were before. Yeah. And okay. glass <clears throat> doesn't do that. It looks the same <laughs> molten as it does solid. Not There is no observable change in its internal structure. So as the as to why it acts as like a solid in one case and a, a liquid in the other is still like basically a complete mystery in hmm. science. That's tight. Yeah. I really, when I learned that, I was like, okay. Humans have known about I glass for a long, long time, right? Yeah. Glass is... 
I would, that's an interesting question. I, um, like how it predates like iron age and all the things, but you know, mm. like lightning creates glass. So you can dig up a glass kind of root. Really? Yeah. Have you, I don't know if you've ever seen like glass, um, lightning strikes the desert, right? And, uh, it the, like it fractals out into the Lichtenberg what? figure and it creates these glass tubes everywhere that the electricity is like dissipating into the earth. That's so tight. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, let's hit the notes. Do, do, do. Oh, that's called the, the glass is an amor- amorphous, uh, non-crystalline amorphous solid. Hmm. Amorphous being lack of form. Yeah. And the fact that it lacks like the qualities of a normal phase transition would almost suggest that it's like a sixth state of matter. They say four, but plasma is actually a state of matter. That's pretty well accepted these days. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if they're teaching it in elementary school, but the scientists all say it. So, yeah. Um, but it's kind of this in-between phase, so maybe it's kind of this weird sixth in-between phase of matter. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, back in the day, so the when I was a kid growing up, they used to say that because they were, um, you look at glass and it looks the same in a solid or in a liquid, the thought was that it just had been slowed down to an extremely slow rate. And if you saw in old glass panes, like you'd go through like a ghost town or something back when glass, flat glass and windows and stuff were kind of a new technology, Mm -hmm. the glass would be thinner at the top and thicker at the bottom. And for a long time, everyone was like, oh, well, that's because it's so old that the glass is like slumping to the bottom slowly. Okay. And that was the thought. And then they did a bunch of rigorous testing and they're like, no, that's actually just they were bad at making glass. So it turns out it doesn't move. And that's when that whole thing came in. They were trying to explain something because there's... If it's not, it's not technically a solid, you know, so they're oh, like, oh, it must it be liquid. Be it's just super okay. slow liquid, like molasses uh. times a hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> and so then they did all this testing and they're like, no, oh my God, it's a mystery. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Well, that's really interesting. Glass is a really curious, uh, form of matter. Yeah. What do you, so do you, what do you think of like, when you think of glass, do you have like a tragic glass story? Like, I don't know, a deer like coming through a windshield or a I do have, I have a cup? ton of scars actually. From glass? Yeah. Like what? Uh, all Scar over, stories are the best. Yeah. All over my left thigh and I've got like some, a couple of three inch. Oh, is this from the car wreck? No, it's not. It's uh, when I was way younger. I don't remember this story, but it's, mm. I'm now telling you a memory I have of my parents telling me a memory. <laughs> um, I was like making brownies for a project for something to do with alligators and I, but I was, my dad was sleeping and I was like, I'm just going to make brownies myself because I'm smart enough. I was really young. It was in Hawaii. So I was under five. I have one of these stories too, actually. Yeah. And so I climbed up to get the green food coloring and, uh, slipped, like stepped too close to the brownie pan, which I'd already pulled out of the oven, I believe, like cooked the brownies. And it was hot and it burned me and I slipped and I fell with the pan and the pan exploded and then I like landed on all the glass shards. Oh, and, so you cooked it in a glass pan? Yeah, I cooked it in a glass no pan. No kidding. And then spilled the pan and then fell off the counter and stabbed myself several times. <laughs> but yeah, that was a story. And they took me to the ER. They said I was fine and that I dealt with it okay uh. as like a kid. I um, I had the same, it's about the same age. I made macaroni and cheese and I dumped a pot of boiling water on myself. So Oof. But my, my fun glass story is uh, when I just moved into this apartment, mm-hmm. um, kind of recently taken a step up, good job, 40 hours a week. I was used to working like 60 hours a week and getting paid for like 30 of those. Oh. Uh, I finally like jumped up to have like a decent situation, all things told, and had a nice place. And I was like, I'm going to Crate and Barrel and I'm going to get myself a really nice measuring cup. Nice. And I did. And it was uh, not Pyrex. Which, I don't know what in the world you'd be, like, a high-end kitchen store, and they don't have a Pyrex. And I'll get to huh. all the, like, what that means. But yeah. um, Pyrex is heat-tempered, but you can't pour hot liquids into non-Pyrex glass. Really? And I didn't realize it wasn't a Pyrex. I knew that, but it, I didn't realize it wasn't Pyrex. Cause what it was happens a really to glass nice, that you pour hot liquid into? It explodes into a million pieces. Really? Oh, it just... You know how, so, um, when a windshield cracks, yeah. right? It doesn't, like, break... Jar- jagged and sharp it's like, like squares. glass yeah it's squares and that's because it's tempered and then the windshields are two pieces of tempered glass smashed with a, a plastic film and that's mm-hmm. why it doesn't actually mm-hmm. bust Shatter. because there's that middle piece that's holding everything together but if it would it would be like un- countless pieces countless yeah really so that would I, fuck you up I just poured this hot water in, and like it was a lot I had a, it was a big really nice measuring cup like and it just court, exploded and it and so boiling water and and glass just 
showered my kitchen. Wow. It was awesome. But, you know, I was like, it was like probably like $25 thing I got Crate and Barrel. And I was like, why in the world would Crate and Barrel sell something? Well, I feel like measuring cups should be Not pirates. useful. Yeah. yeah, dude, you're in the kitchen. How else mm. are you going to make your Jello? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I have a real sense of memory with the Jello, uh, the, the red Kool Aid stuff oh, yeah. being mixed in a big glass Pyrex, Pyrex glass, yeah. measuring cup. Oh, gelatin. <laughs> oh, gelatin. Oh, gelatin. So, the types of glass mm-hmm. the one that you think of, you know of, the one you can see, like this is silicate glass because mm-hmm. it's mostly silicon oxide, you know, uh, silica being the most abundant material in the earth's crust gotcha uh, it is the major component of sand and it is why sand when struck with lightning or you can just melt it and make glass but in fact there is a video on the internet of a guy who uh, took a giant magnifying glass and like That's two tight. foot around and he had little motor controls on it so he could pinpoint the the little dot you know uh-huh. like um, magnifying glass dot and he would melt the sand like in a layer and then the machine would push a little bit more sand over the top of it and he'd melt the second layer and it's a 3d printer and he just makes like it's not very accurate or anything but it's just but like with wood a, and motors and, and an arduino glass, yeah yeah it's magic that's tight it's super tight uh, so there's some silica glass stuffs out there. Fuse quartz, quartz glass is like mm. crystal. Like so, like remember back in the day when the husband would be like tap the salt shaker. There was that joke you always saw in the movies, and it was like, I think this is made out of crystal. Put this in your pocket. Mm. And like, uh, well, I forgot to remember the name of that company was Waldorf or something like that. There was a really famous glass company on the East Coast. Uh, but that's a uh, that's quartz glass, and that stuff is really good for high end scientific stuff when you need like extremely high precision type yeah. of things. And uh, soda lime is like what the standard is. And soda lime is a mixture of soda and lime, which gives the glass a couple of properties. What is soda? Um, Soda potash. So um, potassium something, something along those lines. Okay. But it's, it's a, that's a pretty common like um, output of industrial, yeah. like a leftover that's used for quite a few things. Very interesting. Um, a lot of our stuff is made, of, made out of like those industrial leftover... Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's so useful. It's not really leftover, but yeah, you dig yeah. stuff out of the ground, and it's one of those things that's everywhere you can find. Yeah. Uh, borosilicate is what you think of like uh, lower end scientific glass and everything you smoke out of when gotcha. you go to a pipe shop. With it, there are some soft glass bongs you'll see, the ones that have the kind of like squished feet that come up into the yeah. bowl, right? Everyone's seen them in any stoner anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but borosilicate is what you smoke out of, like a standard spoon bowl. Uh, then some other randoms. There's a lead glass. Lead does has some really nice properties. What? It makes it really workable. Is the glass still clear, same looking kind? Or is yeah, it color? and um, I believe it even cleans it up a little bit. There's kind of a natural bluish green in a like raw glass, and nice. lead, lead will give you a nice clarity and a workability to it. But it, huh. it is not uh, safe to handle long term. It's oh, pretty really? low term. It's low exposure, but it's still not great. Is what radio radioactive or what? No, that's heavy metal. Lead, heavy. lead is just not um, good for you at all. That why, whole group on that. Um, why are heavy metals bad for you to touch? They get in your blood, or not what? exactly, not exactly touch, but like a long term exposure to them. Um, what does that mean? Do, just being near I, to you, or being I, in your water, or what? Well, I mean, I wore an aluminum. Uh, I wore an aluminum bracelet, and it destroyed my wrist. And my wrist was better in it in like two hours when I took it off. But really? I wore it for like three weeks and couldn't figure out why my wrist hurt. Um, but all of those glasses just have like an energetic nastiness to them i'm trying to remember the specific a lot of that stuff is really hard for your body to get rid of Mm -hmm. um it also might just be your body having reactions to some of those things because it knows it it doesn't want yeah that inside of it i know aluminum is really rough on your nervous system well they guess it's probably a lot of nervous because lead makes you go mercury that makes Mm -hmm. you go crazy Mm -hmm. um anyway so there's aluminum silicate glass a german silicate germanium silicate uh and then you get into the non, what you think of as glass, like there's some plastics, polymers, acrylics, poly- okay. polystyrene, uh, but that's like CDs, mm-hmm. right? That plastic, uh, that's uh, technically a glass. Yeah. It has that glassy sheen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then so some cool stuff that glass can be used with, uh, fiberglass, which is tiny microscopic threads of glass stretched out. And woven into threads of glass, like really tiny, like human hair or or, or thinner. Can they bend? Yeah, they're quite flexible. Hmm. Glass is interestingly flexible. Where did I, I watched a video the other day of a woman uh, that she took a ratchet strap to a big, like four foot table, a piece of glass that they would fit on top of this table, yeah, and bent it with a ratchet strap. And she was just standing there, like wrenching on it for like 
I think she must have been doing it for 35, 40 minutes, but it was yeah. a sped up video because who wants yeah. to do that on YouTube? <laughs> um, but yeah, it got like pretty bent like, before it snapped. Yeah, like to a full U. Wow. And then, which yeah. is pretty dope. But. Yeah. Um, it, does that have to do with its uh, uh, atomic makeup or its flexibility and chemical structure? Like that you talked about how it's not quite as solid. The glass. Yeah, I'm not. I, I don't know how that relates. Hmm. That's too technical for my the depth of the research I did this week. But hmm. um, you can get different, like more bendable, less bendable glass based on the things you put into it. Very interesting. Um, but yeah, fiberglass is that's what's in your house. The pink stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that's all just a bunch of microscopic glass fibers, which it can is, kill you if you breathe it in. Right? Yeah, be careful. Mm-hmm. Glass is actually really nasty on the lungs. I'll get, I'm getting into blowing glass and that kind of okay. stuff in a bit. But um, so other glass fibers, that's what uh, the internet runs on mm-hmm. fiber optic, where light is shown down a tiny little fiber cable and can run for thousands and thousands of miles and be picked up on the other side with very little loss of information quality at very high light, speeds. Right. Yeah, so and you just have a diff- different frequencies of mm-hmm. light inside there and different uh, channels, basically, of those. In the same way that like, you tune a radio, right? So at the low end of the spectrum yeah. and the high end of the spectrum. In the same way, you just do that, but in high-frequency light. Um, but they can carry a massive amount of information on a tiny little glass fiber. So yeah. that stuff's pretty wild. Yeah. And then, like, eyeglasses. You know, you had a pair of eyeglasses that are way lighter than other ones. Those yeah. are, like, a crazy polymer plastic glass mm-hmm. instead mm-hmm. of an actual glass. Mm. Uh, so if you want to color glass, that's, those are additions of chemicals. Random examples, iron and creamy uh, chromium will give you green, sulfur, and carbon. Give you the amber, like, be- normal beer glass and, Man, we and use, wine bottles. We use a lot more rocks than we uh, purport to in, <laughs> in American culture. I would agree with that. Just for industrial sake, mostly. But Well, that's one of the reasons I like glass, want to talk about glass, too, is that it's one of the only, and the original, recyclable material. Really? Yeah, we don't recycle shit, but glass is about as close as you're going to get to something that's actually recyclable. Mm-hmm. So, but the issue is the chemical makeup is very important. So when you're just you can't just like go and pick up a big pile of glass and like melt it back it's down it's gotta be the same stuff yeah you have to know you can do test batch and stuff so if you have like you know let's say you buy a shipping container of glass from someone who's collecting glass like your local recycling center sure you could uh, either sort it into similar bottles or you could crush it all down and then make a bunch of test batches and figure out what that particular glass needs Mm -hmm. because you have to add back the soda and lime kinds of things Mm -hmm. into the batch to make it workable again because glass has a memory which is one of the most interesting things about it what yeah so if you like if you're blowing glass Uh uh the glass has an amount of time and a number of times that it can be heated and then re-expanded before it uh just is like okay i'm done and it begins to like lose the nice even round curve and shininess to it and it gets a little like warbly like kind of like a bumpy skull so, I mean, if you think of someone with a shaved head and a bumpy skull it gets this weird like bumpy wrinkly to it because um, under the heat it's off gassed a couple of the things that make it workable it loses its workability and so anything you do with glass like a formed product it's going to need to be like reinvigorated so there's with- no way to truly recycle most anything for that basic property right not easily yeah you know it takes a a good deal amount of work so if you i looked into running a business on recycled glass and you have the most important thing is having consistent feedstock so you want to go to like you'd want to go to snapple and be like how much do you charge like how much can i buy your glass for because you already know the chemical makeup of the glass that's coming out Mm -hmm. and there's no like real variable in there so that's when you because otherwise you'd need like kind of like a brewmaster basically of glass you have like you'd hired that guy to give you the recipe and you have your feed your feedstock or if you're bringing in random shit all the time then you're gonna need a guy there figuring that out yeah. every single time every single batch so yeah. that makes it an interesting challenge but mm. it is doable mm. um and you know some standardization like if there was i think that the world should all be carrying around like the mice in jar let's just do that yeah you know there's cool little like silicone rubber things that go over the top of it makes it way less breakable and yeah. those things are pretty bulletproof anyway so yeah yeah i love mason jars yeah i saw uh, a little article for mason jar omelet have you seen that you make a little omelet in a mason jar you can make like 10 of them at a time and then whenever you're ready you just take a mason jar out wait in the oven microwave no in, in a frying pan but you you take it you take it out of the mason oh jar, you pour it like out you you create the omelet it. first yeah you can create it no you can make it layered it. and then 
put it in and it comes out pretty good. That's a good idea. Yeah. Tons of little food prep things you can do. Also, mason jars are brilliant because uh, they're aromatically sealed. So you can do cool fermentation stuff mm. with mason jars. You just have to replace the tops. I've done a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mason jars. You know, um, the one of the pre- there's two basic major brands, but one is Ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they got their start. I think the original thing was in Boulder. But the most random thing you can possibly imagine, they're like, hey, we make jars for storing food in. And we've done such a good job and we've made such money. Let's put satellites into space. Really? Those are the things they do? Yeah. So ball jars, they used all their money to start an aerospace company. And there was probably kind of a natural transition because they're a for, they're one of the foremost early pioneers of glass on the industrial level uh-huh. in America, right? So I'm sure high-tech companies were coming to them and be like, hey, you guys know about glass. What are the chances you could do this? I don't know this story for sure. I'm speculating, but there's a high yeah. chance that... They were coming to him for high-end glass, yeah. and they got tied in with some high-end industries, and the next thing they're like, what are we going to do? And they probably just either bought or found some guy who was like, I'm starting an aerospace company. And they're like, all right, ball aerospace. And that was like one of the big boomtown things that started at Boulder. Yeah? Yeah. Wow. I've been there. I've been in a clean room at Ball's Aerospace and saw a satellite. Was there a, uh, a location in Boulder? Yeah. So they're still there. I think it's still the original campus. Hmm. But it's really weird. You walk around inside this high tech place that like puts satellites into space, and there's pictures of like old school people like busting out glass jars. That's great. <laughs> Good. Super. I random. have some ball mason jars. What's the other one? Can you name it? Off the top of your head? No. Mm. I'm bad with names. For the love of mason jars. I don't do labels. Oh, another little fun thing. Uh, glass, like most of the color you see, like on the outside of glass, is a metal coating. So, and like in a pipe. That's a, like literally silver. So, in, if you're glass working, you put the silver into the flame, mm-hmm. and you—I uh, wish I could remember the terms—but you turn the oxygen down because the oxygen, the silver oxidizes as well. Gotcha. So, um, but you spray it onto the outside of the glass, or you can have like a, a gasification chamber, like in a scientific glass kind of thing. You would have your glass mounted nicely, and then. Um, you probably suck all the air out into a vacuum chamber and you might electrify the situation a little bit, but then you um, boil off a couple of metal compounds and they adhere to the outside of the glass. And then that's going to do things like filter out certain frequencies of light or reflect a certain, um, there'll be things like lasers coming through a piece of glass and it'll Mm -hmm. be coated with a thing and one part of the laser will go through and another part of the laser will bounce to the side. So it creates different colors and effects. And And that's all just metal film coatings on the outside Mm. of glass. What other things are coated with metal? Like glass things that are coated with metal? Um, old school window tinting. Okay. Like that, remember that blue strip that was off the top? Yeah. Of, that's a metal film coating. Huh. Um, what else? That was already a great example. I'm, I'm <laughs> satisfied. Well, I talked, we talked about uh, recycling. Um... I think before I get into blowing glass, let's do the Prince Rupert's drop. So one of the things about glass, one of the most interesting and challenging aspects of it is that it expands and contracts like most things uh, under when it's heated. And you can, again, change like how much it expands and contracts based on what kind of chemicals are in it. And one of the attractive things about borosilicate glass, the stuff that pipes are mm-hmm. – smoking pipes are made out of, is that it expands and contracts less, which gives you a better um, – ability to make complex shapes um but the interesting thing is is that heat moves really slow in glass so you have your ball of glass and the outside cools first so you have this hard shell that forms around the outside of this molten ball Mm -hmm. and so as the molten ball cools it starts to shrink but the outside of the ball is already a specific size and hard and so it basically like pulls down in on itself yeah, just yeah. like suit and it's an incredible amount of forces so it, there's a thing called the prince rupert's drop and you just take a ladle of like molten glass like nice and gooey and drop it into a bucket of water and it hardens as it hits the water yeah totally and so uh tech guys in there uh miles if you wouldn't mind go to the computer and we'll pull up the prince rupert's drop and this is uh um smarter every day so if you've never heard of smarter every day the most one of the better YouTube channels out there and he just does crazy science stuff with his, he and his kids he's like kind of a science teacher kind yeah. of guy and he's just awesome at it so I just got a couple quick clip and he's holding the, you can we can see he's holding the drop here and the thing about the Prince Rupert's drop is that the, the bulbous portion of the drop is mm-hmm. in, indestructible bulbous. because of these 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's because of all this internal tension. It's like pushing it's down. Indestructible. On this is, it's literally indestructible. Um, how do you test that? Well, that's what he does. And so like, they're going to, they, they've, um, I've picked a portion where we're just going to highlight how the fracture travels in it, yeah. but the same video he smacked and there's tons of them. There's guys shooting with a bullet. The, um, uh, what is it? The 4k, uh, the slow motion guys, I mean, mm-hmm. the slow motion guys, mm-hmm. they have a whole channel. They do things in slow motion. They have a thing on their Prince Rupert drop and it's amazing. Like they, they're squashing with a press yeah. and you see it in slow-mo and it doesn't squash it. It does this weird like skippy bounce thing. And then you see the tail like whip so hard it snaps the tail and then the tail runs from tail to head at every time. It's like wow. you, they're indestructible, but the tail is hyper fragile. Yeah. And so we're going to see that it actually busts from back to front. Oh, stop thinking. What is this YouTube? Yeah. It could be that we are streaming and the internet is busy. I was doing it earlier. We were streaming then bandwidth all right well i guess the internet's gonna ruin everything no it's gonna also <laughs> change society and our consciousness oh yeah it already has obviously. yeah it has done all right. those things how do you feel do you i i really think that like it is this precursor to this connected ability that we're it all is. going to have of course it is like it's we, we i mean we've wanted the internet since before it existed you know that's yeah. what like mail and all that stuff is a was a progression toward what eventually became this which is you're right, like a highly connected in society of information, where you get to learn about glass and learn about the government, learning about conspiracy theories and our favorite musicians. It's a weird, wide world, the internet, man. I thought about doing. Uh, I will definitely have to do like an internet show. This isn't an internet show. No, I mean like uh, my I do a podcast about the internet. Yeah, yeah, I understood. I understood. Oh well. Well, YouTube's. You're going to have to look it up yourself. Up. Maybe we would get banned for copyright Apologies issues for bad radio. Anyway. But nonetheless, um, they smack you with a hammer, and then you can see, in, and they have to do it at super, super slow mo, 100,000 frames per second. Like, wow. An amazing camera. Uh, because it, it travels so fast. But every time they, you know, there's tons and tons of videos, and every single mm-hmm. one, they smack it, and the shock shakes the tail, and then the tail breaks, and then that fracture runs down the length of the Rupert's drop to then destroy the bulbous portion and here in smarter every day he breaks it down like frame by frame knowing how much time it takes to snap between frames how big the drop is how fast the fracture moves and it turns out to be a mile a second wow yeah like That's 1500 crazy. meters per second mm. uh let's let's look at some pictures glass yay uh this guy here oh we'll see if this even works Let's give it a shot. I, I ran a glass lathe for a while, so if you're in glass blowing studio, a glass what? Glass a glass lathe. Glass lathe. Yeah. L a t h e. Yeah. Lathe. Yeah, and so it's just spinning the glass. When you're glass working, you're spinning the mm-hmm. uh, guys with your hands, mm-hmm. and so the lathe takes the spinning portion out, mm-hmm. and it gives you a lot of interesting control. Eh, that's mm-hmm. not going to work either. Uh, so anyway, in terms of blowing glass, like if you want to be an artist and you want to work with glass. You have three major options. Uh, two of them are blowing glass, and one mm-hmm. will be it's called soft, and the other one is working with borosilicate or lamp mm-hmm. working. Mm-hmm. And this is soft glass. It's kind of big. It's thick. Um, this is, you know, you see the people with the metal pipes and pulling things out of the kilns, you know, and working them in, the, like, the metal bars on their laps and stuff. Um, that's soft glass. Mm. And it's called soft glass because it's a little bit more malleable. You have a longer working time. Uh, sort of easier to work with overall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A little less kind of sensitive to environmental changes. And then you have uh, working with borosilicate. And we can see here that this is uh, you know, the scientific angle of borosilicate. But we'll come over here to uh, like this guy right here. That is a borosilicate-like piece that's probably going to go on to the end of a pipe. And um, this is a propane torch blowing a specific mixture of propane and oxygen. And you can adjust the amount of oxygen contact for hotter and colder flame. And the oxygen also has some kind of chemical properties with the colors, Mm. with the glass, with the Mm. additives of the glass and stuff. So it's actually a really complex operation of heat this, cool this down, lots of heat, little bit of heat. There's a Netflix documentary on uh, blowing glass. And how it really only became an industry 15 years ago when some, this one dude figured out how to do exactly this. 
it wasn't like super long ago, like how to make pipes and art out of coloring glass differently based on the chemicals you used to blow into it and all that stuff. Well, the um, soft glass, art glass goes way back. Like the Italian guys like go back to yeah. the 1400s. Yeah. Something. But it's don't, not, it's don't not an industry. There's nothing explained. It, it wasn't an industry uh, like pipes and bongs and all that whatnot until fairly recently. Yeah. And now it's a huge industry. Like the Cthulhu guy, is that that guy? Yeah, Cthulhu. Yeah. I saw his exhibit at Botanic Gardens. It was super cool. Yeah. And he's a, that's a soft glass art. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, he doesn't, hardly at all, he doesn't really blow glass. He just, um, did you see like the paintings? He has like the squirt yeah. bottle paintings. And yeah. he's like, this is basically what I want to look like. And then people kind of like make a shape. And he's like, that's close, do it again. He's like, yeah. oh, that's closer, do it again. And then he's like, stack it like this. But he doesn't actually, you watch him, he doesn't touch anything. Mm-mm. But he tells people to put it together. But it's pretty fascinating how they get all they get put together and they look they're so fragile you know yeah they're amazing i love the one they left at the botanic gardens where is it uh in that kind of um all the way in the back so like when you walk into the the gardens like you come up to like the main building right yeah, yeah. if you just hang a left and you yeah. go all the way to the left to there's the that fence. other building at the back yeah and there's a like it's a big kind of oval um walk around section with an inner planter and he's got it's big and yellow and red mm. and it's uplit and there's a couple other things there, but that's the big show piece that he left behind. I love glass pieces because you can light them very well. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. The transmission of light. That's mm. one of the fundamental properties of glass. That's why it's cool. Mm-hmm. Do, do, do. Oh, and I wanted to talk about... So if you are a person who's interested in doing art glass... Yeah. Uh, oh, the other one you can do is um, flat flat glass annealing. What is that? Uh, annealing? Uh, annealing. I mean, we didn't talk about annealing because that's very annealing. important and one of the big challenges of glass. But um, flat glass is slumping. So you can take like strips of glass and I have pictures. So strips of glass. This is a very good example. So see these all these little strips and pieces and parts. Huh. So you put it in a kiln and then there is a, a ceramic dish to the shape. And so it melts into the shape mm-hmm. and then you can choose how much you want it to melt mm. because the kiln has a very... Uh, there's a technical little uh, con- temperature controller on it, and mm-hmm. you, you create a pattern, as uh, a, a recipe, essentially. So you're like, okay, I need to take the temperature up really, really slow mm-hmm. uh, because it takes a while for heat to soak in the glass because it's an insulator. So you don't want to stress the glass by too much by pumping a lot of heat into it too mm-hmm. quickly. Mm-hmm. So you got to take it up really slow. So you have these controllers that do that. And then you basically get up to the melting point, and what you do is you sit like right at the melting point, and then for something like this where you only want it to melt a little bit, you go like, boop, melt, stop melting. And you yeah. just give it a little like, eh, and it's like sticks together. And you might have to try this like seven or eight times to get the right recipe for that formula, for but that then thickness. It would be perfect every time. Yeah, but then you can just bang like it out and yeah. you use the same settings again. Uh, and then so the other th- things you can do is, you know, you can put sh- – um, you know, you lay them over any kind of shape you want and they slump into that shape. And this, you can oh, use uh, ceramic molds or this is a stainless steel mold, but you have to coat this. Sort with of a, like gravity molding in a certain way. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I, I, the most interesting thing about that for me is that like the time control, because you just have to be like, you have to touch it like, right. ah, oh, just yeah. enough. Just a little. <laughs> it's crazy that it all responds and reacts so perfectly. Oops. Every time. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, so if you want to blow glass, and let's assume that you want to get into borosilicate glass blowing, um, the big things you're going to need is a torch. Mm-hmm. You need your propane tank and an oxygen tank. And you have to have ventilation because glass is very dangerous to breathe. Uh, if you, really? You, yeah, like the dust. Cause, um, glass dust will definitely fuck your shit. Yeah, there's like a glass lung. I think it's called Scylla. Hmm, I should know that. Mm. I've been out of the game a little bit too long, but... Yeah, you want if you don't have a fan in your shop, you're in for a rough, you know, your later years. It adds up. Yeah. So you want a big ventilation fan, like yanking all of the air out of your shop, and you need a torch. And depending on how big the piece you want to work, depends on how big your torch needs to be. Wow. And then you need some uh, tools for working, like pressing and squeezing. And there's a special kind of pair of scissors for glass that you'll mm-hmm. see. Really interesting thing. Um, you use beeswax, and you get the, your little tool hot, and then you coat the the metal with beeswax and it gives you cuz glass will stick to metal like yeah. just like if you just took like a hot iron rod and like stuck it in the glass it like grab a hold of that glass huh. and the grab a hold of that iron so you have to like have special tools yep. that are okay with heat and don't have that sticky adhesion nature hmm. with glass and so if you're dealing with like a stainless steel or something you can uh, coat it with a couple of things or like a beeswax works temporarily and you have to temporarily and you have to keep recoating your hmm. thing um, but all the other tools are graphite 
because graphite moves smoothly against molten glass and it doesn't burn because it's just pure carbon. Hmm. And there's a couple of little trick little tools and stuff, uh, but you definitely need some, you probably want like a leather apron, you want leather gloves, uh, there's special glasses that tune out specific frequencies. So like right here, uh, this would look just like blasted out yellow and you wouldn't be able to see it. This, this picture was taken with. Uh, a, a filter on it, so mm -hmm. you have the, and that's a really the, my favorite things about going to a glass shop is like looking at the flame with the glasses on, glasses off, glasses on. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a major difference. It's it's really impressive, and it's also the frequencies are a little damaged. You don't want to be staring into something that bright. So really, as usual, it's like welding, but on a very minor scale in that regard. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that you did that for because looking at it would destroy your. I figured it was just to protect your face from sparks. The, well, the welding the mask, yeah, yeah. Well, the welding is a high energy UV light, and it will burn your eyes. Really? I mean, it, it gives you skin burn. You that's you have to be fully dressed, not just for the sparks flying, but you'll get a skin uh, sunburn like really quickly. Isn't that and technically radiation? Yeah, light radiation. Light radiation. But yeah. it's a it's a very different kind of sunburn. You get burned in the sun, and it has this kind of like I don't know, like a warm quality of like it, yeah. you're getting the whole spectrum of light that's kind of frying you. And I'm certain, you know, it's the UV end that's the most powerful in burning you. But in welding, it is the very kind of high end of UV and it feels like kind of a prickly burn rather than the kind of like hot Indian burn. Like a um, chemical burn almost. Yeah. It's kind mm. of in that arena of things. Mm. Uh, let's see what else. Gloves, glasses, ventilation. Oh, okay. So then kiln and kneeling. This is the big thing. This is what makes glass blowing really the challenge is that because of all these internal stresses, uh, stresses of the glass expanding and contracting, uh, you'll get like weak points and failure points in the glass. Mm. And the way you get around that is you take the whole thing up. Cause if you have one part that's hot and one part that was cold, the point where the hot and the cold meet kind of like thunderstorm happens where hot yeah. air meets cold air, yeah. there's all the internal stresses come to a point at that point. And like a uh, fun little trick, you can, um, cut a glass bottle, you wrap it with a piece of string and then you coat the string in something flammable and you light it on fire. It'll cut the glass right And yeah, it creates the stress point right where that string was touching the glass, and then you just tap it, and it will snap. You know, It takes a little bit of talent to get like nice, mm -hmm. clean cut. But um, So glass has like is very reactive to the temperature, and the way you're going to, like for example, if you went to cut the glass and you didn't like it, you'd have to re-anneal it to get back to something that wouldn't break on that line again. Mm -hmm. And annealing is much like the slumping of glass, where you have a specific timer, um, like if you're working a piece of glass, you work it and there's an amount of time where you like stick it back in the kiln and bring the whole piece back up to temperature yeah, yeah. and then bring it back out and you'll be working one section piece while the other side is kind of like slowly cooling down. So you put it back in the kiln and you mm -hmm. bring it back out. Cause if you're just like working there and you just keep working and you keep working, all the thing will just like snack and explode in your face and you start for over. So hmm. how long did you say you worked in glass? Know, a year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah. What'd you do? Uh, well, I just basically like made the precursor parts for the most part. Uh, a really good friend of mine is a glass blower, and I needed like a really flexible working situation, and he could pay me just enough to basically survive while I was off dealing with life on the side. Nice. And uh, so I just showed up every day and sat in the chair and watched for hours and hours, and um, and then sat down and then made, you know, because there if you go to a glass shop, it's an internship like Johnny Tremaine, you know. And it's serious. It's like, like Johnny Tremaine. I love that book. Yeah, you didn't get your hand melted though. Yeah, for that's for sure. Yeah. He, what did he do? Silver. Silver. Yeah. You don't want to. You don't want to get silver on you. That would be crazy. Molten silver. That'll burn the shit out of you. Yeah, which makes me think of Game of Thrones and molten gold. Yeah, that was but if a great you, He burned his hand in molten silver. My question always was like, was there any silver left on his hand? <laughs> Right, like if you seriously, if you burn yourself with molten silver, there would it wouldn't it would like merge some of it would merge with your hand, right? It wouldn't just be a burn. Well, I don't know. It might stick to your bone or something, but the flesh is just gonna like drop just away, destroy it. Yeah. Oh, that would be terrible. Yeah, it'd be the worst. Yeah. yeah. But how does that book end? Was so he? I know he gets it in the apprenticeship and he burns his hand with silver, and then. He, like, leads a revolution or some shit, doesn't he? Yeah, I feel like he's, like, Paul Revere's, like, he was the secret behind Paul Revere or something. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's been, I was, like, really young when I read that. Yeah, obviously, me too. So. That's a very weird political propaganda book to be yeah, right? feeding to young children. <laughs> oh, yeah. say, Johnny Tremaine. Mm -hmm. No? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. It was Let's a weird it. story, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What were we talking about? Oh, yeah, kil Kilns and Anelia. Yes, yes. So the whole time you're working on glass... You have to be keeping the glass up to temperature. Yep. Otherwise, it'll fracture. And then when you're done, 
you put it in there and then you start to like the finish timer and it's going to take it up right just below the melting point so it doesn't actually get to the liquid state and the timer goes off and it'll hold it for a while and Mm -hmm. then it cools down very very slowly so like Mm. you be leaving the shop at six o'clock at night and when you get back you know like we were doing like 10 to 6 at the minimum so it probably finishes at like 4 or 5 6 in the morning you know like it takes most of the night to like wow. slowly creep back down to a normal temperature hmm. but that gives you a nice even stress uh, profile inside the glass and that makes it much more durable gotcha so then the interesting thing about um, pipes and stuff is that they're pretty durable and I'm sure most people probably smokers have had experienced the thing where they dropped a pipe and they're like oh my god and like, oh, wow, break. it survived. Yeah. And then you drop it again, you're like, oh, my God, it survived. And then you drop it again, you're like, oh, my God, it survived. And then you drop it again, you're like, this pipe is amazing. And then you, like, crack it against your teeth and it falls apart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's because glass has a memory. You can only you can only mess with it for so long before it's finally like, all right, That's man, I really interesting that it has longer. that kind of structural memory. Mm-hmm. How does that work? I have no idea. Zero. Really? I mean, it's one of the mysteries of it. I mean, yeah. there's something like... I don't know. It's interesting. Like, like a little stress point is like building up slowly over time until right. it finally is like finds oh, that's it. That's the straw. Then, then that crack happens. Camelback is broken. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm sure that's a metaphor. Oops, sorry. Spiritually, for like how stress eventually causes breakages. Yeah, very interesting. Why'd you? Uh, why'd you? Why were you interested in talking about glass today? Um, honestly, because it was uh, something I felt like I could talk about a little. Yeah, I'm not, it wasn't, I'm, this is really like the next week I really have to put like two days into podcast planning instead of mm-hmm. like, you know, three quarters or maybe one. So, and I'm like, well, the guests start showing up, I think next week and I can start, there's a, cause some things I would feel comfortable talking about, but I really yeah. don't want to like spoil it without, I'm, the guest thing is getting started now that we're like yeah. getting official. Yeah, definitely. I'm not nearly as connected to you. I don't have like a huge Rolodex. I can just start tapping into people. Yeah. I have a pretty crazy, but it's just cause of the lifestyle I live. And, but yeah, and you also, you, there's an, you have an element of legitimacy in that regard. Like, you know, you approach yeah. people and you say, I'm doing this thing. You know, and like I have an element of legitimacy, but it's not interpersonal like that. People are like, oh, you make stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I could make that, you know, but I'm like, come show up on my podcast. And they're like, you're podcasting, but you're like, not (laughs) that doesn't, you don't, you're not a media personality. I think you're great. You got a good personality, Samson. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I think I do too. I'm, I'm confident in this situation, but it is interesting to be like, oh, we've got a new venture and you definitely have to like give people the opportunity to be like, wait, what? (laughs) Yeah. It's a, it is weird to be here on the internet in the what is event actually going to be like an eternal stream of information right this will probably exist forever in some regard in some regard yeah totally Mm -hmm. who knows about data storage for reals though but who knows i mean it could it has the potential to exist nearly forever it is a really interesting thought look okay just if let's assume that it lasts a really long time let's uh, let's say that uh some kids like oh i'm gonna do like um my family tree yeah. And he goes back like 15 generations and he's like, there's this dude, Samson. He was like podcasting. I'm going to watch his podcast. And you're like, that's my great, 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 great grandfather talking yeah. about random crap yeah. on the internet. That's great. Back when people were dumb. Back when people <laughs> were dumb before they could download information directly into their consciousness. Yeah. Silly but humans. Why did they have an internet at all? Yeah. You know, that's one of the, um, the things that people are looking for in terms of, you know, like I personally believe that intelligent life is out there and we're talking to it you know but Hmm. the people who are uh like oh we should go looking for intelligent life one of the things that people are scanning this guy and looking for is the um the wireless universal internet backbone really yeah so the thought is that like the internet universe is pretty old and if there were intelligent civilizations out there you know they would have had plenty of time to like proliferate and kind of fill the universe so Mm -hmm. there should be some sort of evidence that they exist i've got a funny feeling that time and space don't work the way we think they do and that uh, you lost me. I was like funny feeling. Yeah. Like climbing the rope in gym class. Uh, no, <laughs> I think, I mean, kind of, I think, well, like time and space are the same phenomenon, right? Which is, oh, I think beyond already human comprehension for most people, but stuff that's out there in space is in a literally in a different time, uh, than when it gets to here, whatever mm-hmm. here is. Well, it, phenomenon. time is relative to speed, which is like a whole mind trip in a way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like you could, uh, like even like three quarters of the speed of light or something, like a three week trip to you would be quite a few years here on earth. Really? Yeah. Mm. There's a, there's a noticeable dis- like an atomic clock on a jet flying 
right? You know, like a little faster than your average commercial jet and stuff. Yeah, but there's, there's a noticeable difference. couple of seconds just in like a trip around the Earth. So, and then if you put atomic clock on a satellite, what are that affects like the an, human body though? You know, like I wonder, I wonder if like your what does that mean that time has changed or that you've lost a few seconds? Like, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to other ways to be able to test that. I'm sure they've done all kinds of stuff. We should do one on time. That's a heavy subject. Yeah. Time is a really weird subject. Yeah. There's a there's a really interesting uh, talk just talking about the podcast and choosing topics and stuff too. I definitely mm-hmm. also am, now that I want to like uh, respect like the listeners and people. You know, like I would I don't want to make a bo- bad podcast. You know, so that's an obvious thing. But I also like really want to respect the subject matter. You know, and like time is like in a way I'm like I don't want to do time. That's too big. It is pretty you know? crazy. There's no way I can get it right. There's no way anyone's getting that right. Yeah, but we can observe and make comments and, you know. And share our perspective. Learn. I got into an interesting conversation last night about um, holographic storage kind of thing and, like, how you have this thing that there's a certain perspective and you can, like, snap, snap it in half and mm-hmm. then it becomes, like, two exact copies or just, like, smaller. But you still have, essentially, a picture of the whole. And we got into a long conversation about kind of a, in an interpersonal level of, like, you have one copy of a, you have you have a perspective right and i have a perspective of an event and we can have a consensus of what happened in that event despite having different perspectives on it hmm. and us our collab our collection of experience with regard to that event can make a more complete picture but hmm. despite the fact that you don't have all the information and i don't have all the information and even as a, as a group we don't have all the information we can still come to a consensus as to whether or not something happened see i i see it the exact opposite way around I, I don't think it's that there is a reality that can be referenced and then agreed upon. Well, that, but I'm saying like if we both went to a party mm-hmm. and like did Joe show up and you're like, yeah, I saw Joe. I'm like, oh, cool. I saw Joe too. So like that's we're both pretty sure that Joe showed up. Yeah. But, but I we would, don't have a whole, we can't collectively regurgitate the party, the whole party, but we can say yeah. like the third set and the DJ was really good and Joe showed up. <laughs> yeah. They're like reference points. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, that's fair. Uh, but no, my, my point was just that there's a, who, I would say who Samson and who's, who Ryan is, is the same consciousness or person or whatever. But what it's like to be Samson is not simultaneously what it's like to be Ryan. So you can't be both at the same time. Not, a, not from our perspective anyway. Mm-hmm. Not from within the perspective of the lens you're looking through. Yeah. What if yeah. there's like this higher order being who's just sitting there being both of us and he's just laughing at us being like, oh, I think there amateurs. is, and it is us. <laughs> I don't think it's like laughing and thinking we're amateurs though. It's, it's why it's expressing itself like this. It's trying to figure out life and itself. <laughs> what are you doing today? Trying to figure out life. Just trying to figure out who I am. <laughs> Nothing big. Well, uh, what's going on in your world, Samson? What's happening in, in your next week? Um, man, what is happening? I got to run some cameras, which is going to be kind of fun. Uh, mm-hmm. Not really. That's not fun at all. What I, for? Actually, I, I will tell. I do have a really good story. Um, my good friend's mom came into town, mm-hmm. and she just bought a little teardrop trailer to tow around, and this is kind of like her first real big trip into what will be kind of her retirement plan. Aww. And she bought this camper trailer new and they like didn't tighten a couple of bolts and the wheels started sliding off. It's oh, kind of, it's kind of a, like, that'll kill you. They overlooked a couple of things design wise, I think so, but the <laughs> wheels started kind of like sneaking out wider and they were clearly vibrating and, um, yeah, yeah. you know, shaking and it was an aluminum frame and aluminum doesn't bend. It's, uh, it's not good for like, uh, fatigue is what they call really? that. So yeah. Even like, though there's aluminum foil. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the thing is, like, steel, you can bend it, 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 bend it. And it takes quite a while before it gets to the point where it starts to, like, rip and tear or break. Mm-hmm. But aluminum has, like, one-third the ability to be bent. And so all the welds underneath started breaking on the axle. And so they, she showed up, and they're like, she knows the problem about most of the way here. And she a really nice, friendly mechanic guy near the campground where she was at. And he put everything back in order and tightened it all down. But then she came in and was like... Uh, my buddy was like, well, we need to prevent that from happening again. And mm-hmm. I climb under there and I was like, ooh, there are bigger issues. Um, and I first had thought, because I saw these cracks and stuff, and I was like, um, you would, you, 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 someone sold this to you and they didn't inspect to find the cracks or anything? Mm-hmm. And then I, because I thought it was a used trailer, because I'm looking at all this like damage. Like, oh, like, shit, oh, this, this is, is new. This, this, yeah. is, this usually takes a while to happen. And then I hear, I realize that she's um, just been sold the thing. Yeah. And it's got these like massive issues and i'm like and then i realized it's because the wheels were coming off and they was shook itself and it was starting yeah. to shake itself to pieces so yeah. 
Uh, I'm going to make, I'm going to replace that one aluminum part with a steel part and then it'll be bulletproof. Um, but it's a really interesting to this really nice woman who yeah. is taking her first, like one of her first like real kind of adventures. She's facing her first, uh, real trouble and her son and, um, his wife with my good friends, they have an RV. And so they've all dealt with all kinds of issues. I've spent like four or five hours at least, uh, helping them sort through some stuff and they call it, you know, RV life because there's always something going on. So right. they are, um, they were sitting there just being like, yep, this is how it goes. You know, yeah. this is what you do. But this woman was very kind of like traumatized and like, yeah. what? Uh, this like is my dream. And this is the thing I want to do. And I'm kind of being shut down mm. on my first try. And um, I think that's a good omen if the universe fucks I, with you in your first, first attempt. Yeah, I think it's a great omen. And I honestly, you know, not to talk myself up too much, but... Um, you know, fixed l- it up good l- lucky her yeah that she knows i mean because i you know super on the cheap and it's really not very difficult thing to do what i'm about to do just like three pieces of metal and stick them back together and make sure everything is like nice and square you, how but, do you stick them back together you weld them yeah weld them yeah. but and i i can weld aluminum but it is not easy so yeah. i got to looking at everything and i was like i'm just gonna make a new one of these because it's just it's just a one bar and two plates with holes so you can bolt it back up to yeah. the frame so i'm just replacing a direct replacement of a thing they made out of aluminum with steel so it won't ever have that problem again nice uh, but yeah that's a really and it feels really good to like this person wants this thing that she's going to interact with on a very intimate level and go on lots of adventures with and like define her life with yeah. and i'm like super stoked because like not only is she having this problem i'm fixing the problem but like i'm pretty confident that I'm delivering her a better product than so she left home with this thing and she's going to get back home with something better than she started with that's like, a good adventure yeah and she's a really cool uh, just the nicest person ever you know and it's Aww. really nice to just kind of like give that to somebody very good Sam be, be like, very good feel comfortable on the road because I've towed some vehicles yeah. on there I've done some sketchy towing and there is nothing uh, m- much more m- r- nerve wracking than being on the road with an unsafe load yes for certain <laughs> yeah uh all right well we're nearing the end so i just that kind of being on safe on the road mm-hmm. and the this is the glass podcast um i guess I'll, i have two kind of fun stories when i was just 16 i had this um mustang that i bought mm-hmm. and my buddy and i went in on a parts car mustang and he t- i took the interior because i didn't like this red interior i had and he took the motor and it had good glass in it, so I had some guys come and pull the glass out of it and put it into my car, and I'd had this uh, broken windshield for quite a while, since I'd bought the car. Mm-hmm. And it was so nice to have a nice, clean glass windshield. And literally day number three, I was driving to my dad's house, and I was behind a truck, and the tire picked up a rock, and I saw it shoot it up into oh. the air. And I did this, like, please don't hit me, please don't yeah, hit me, please don't <laughs> hit me. And, yeah. like, right dead center of the windshield. And I, I had a perfect glass windshield for, like, three days. Three days. days. Yeah. So typical. It I happens. pulled to my, yeah, and I was you know young and still kind of dealing with that stuff. So I pulled to my dad's driveway and I told it was just like mad and I kicked the bumper in the tires and cried a little bit, you know. Yeah, I was like three hundred dollars, man. Like, <laughs> three months, man. Just a material object. I can't, I can't believe this stuff keeps happening to me, man. <laughs> my dad's like standing there, like laughing at me. Um, but another fun story that we didn't have any glass. Um, Driving across Texas, I did a, f- a pheasant, like a big bird. Yeah. Flew up out of the ditch of the corner and just like bounced right off the windshield. Oh. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Did it crush your windshield or? No, like just, it was one of those things. Right that, off yeah, it. we both were like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> tai Chi bird. I did when I was a kid. Actually, the most dangerous thing that's ever happened in that regard was uh, I grew up in northern Colorado and there's lots of sugar beet mm-hmm. situations and we were behind a, sh- behind a sugar beet truck and my mom was driving one of the beat up work trucks because it was one of those days. And a big rock, like, you know, like a large potato sized rock pops off the top of the sugar beet truck and lodged into the windshield. Like Whoa. it landed resting on the dash. I think the craziest thing I've ever had hit my windshield was a phone. Really? Yeah. I think that someone, is crazy. I was going the opposite. Di- like I wasn't going the opposite direction. Someone going the opposite direction of me on the highway threw their phone out. It was like an old brick phone kind of. It wasn't a brick. Nokia, would you? Because that would have just totaled your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was some flip phone, but it's like someone got mad or something. They flipped you off. And they threw it and it hit my windshield and exploded. Yeah. Rad. Yeah, it was cool. Right on. Well, hey, this has been Nothing Explained. Yeah. And uh, if there ever has been a podcast where I didn't explain anything, you anything. <laughs> This is it. That's all right. <laughs> Bet you, there might be one person out there who's like, yes, glass. I've been waiting to learn about this. Well, you know, whatever. I hope that someone uh, yeah. learned something. So. Yeah. Glass, it's a big subject, like everything. So, 
Um, joining me as always, Ryan Fu. Hello. Il-Fu, at Ilfuminati on Twitter. Mm-hmm. My name is Steve Sampson. Stamson. Everybody, Stamson. Everybody calls me Sampson. Uh, I am Nothing Explained on Twitter. And we are the We Are Denver Podcast Collective. Hashtag We Are Denver. Mm-hmm. Catch us uh, out there in Denver. And if you are an interesting person making Denver more interesting, Holler at us. We want to talk yeah. to you. Get on the podcast. All right, big up to Ghost House Studios where we record. That's right. Live in Denver. See you next week. Love and peace. Peace.